Good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, Historic Reno Preservation Society Speaker Series. I'm Susan Mullen, co-chair with Sherry Hayes Zorn of the HARPS Program Committee. We're happy to be back doing live programs. A note, our November 13th program here at the library is a Chautauqua presentation of Mrs. Mackey and the Bonanza King, uh, presented by Victoria Fraser. But today, Scott Carey will open our eyes to the way our Truckee River has shaped our region from the early Native Americans, from the early Native American tribes to today's cities and rural communities. Scott grew up in Sparks and attended schools there. He has, uh, he's a graduate of UNR and is a lifetime member and volunteer at the Sparks Heritage Museum, serving on the Board of Trustees since 2009. And he's a state lands planner for the state of Nevada. Please welcome Scott Carey. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly th this afternoon about the Truckee River. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, connection with, with the river and, and the Great Basin peoples. Then I'm going to talk about two historic floods that we've had, the, the Great Flood of 1955 and the New Year's Flood of, of 1997. And so from this, I hope that you folks kind of can, can learn a new appreciation for the history of the Truckee River, kind of learn how it's, how it's shaped our, our history as, as a region, and, and really overall its, it's importance to all of us and, 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 its, and its history. Um, before I, I dive into the presentation, as a lifetime member of the Sparks Heritage Museum and a member of our Board of Trustees, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't put in a plug for the Sparks Heritage Museum. See a couple of our, our members here and, and volunteers, but we're located downtown Sparks, the corner of uh, Victorian Avenue and, and Pyramid Way. There's, we're a community-run, community-supported organization. Um, there's three ways you can help us. One, come and visit us. This summer we put in a new exhibit um, about the Sparks Police Department. We also have another great exhibit we recently opened um, about the Lincoln Highway, so come, come check us out. Um, the other way you can help us is to volunteer your time. We're always in need of, of volunteers to help uh, man, man, the, man, the, man the front desk and lead, and lead tours. And the third way you can help us out is, is donate. And we'll, we'll, we are a 501c3 organization, and so please come, come check us out. But enough with the, with the commercial. I um, wanted to begin talking about the people who have lived along the banks of the Truckee River, well, since forever. Um, and and the, here in the Great Basin, we have primarily four bands of, of, of Native American people. Um, here in northern Nevada, that's kind of this uh, tan area here. Um, we have the, the, the Northern Paiute people, or as they call themselves, the Namu. And us. then around um, here in the Truckee Meadows and up, up along Lake, Lake Tahoe, we have the Washoe people, as they call themselves, the, the Washishu. And here in, uh, out in eastern Nevada and central Nevada, that's uh, Shoshone country, and they call themselves the, the, the Nui. And then down in southern Nevada, we have the southern Paiute people who call themselves the, the, the Nuwu. Um, Today in Nevada, we have 27 federally recognized tribes, believe it or not. And each one has their own unique history, culture, and, and traditions. Um, but one thing I think that is, that is really kind of ties all of the people of the Great Basin, native and non-native, is, is water. And water is life. You know, we obviously rely on the Truckee River to grow these beautiful plants out here in the, in, in the library, but also to sustain, to stay, sustain our, our modern society. As we know, um, the Truckee River, it runs from Lake Tahoe, 116 miles eastward and north, out, out, and it ends out in Pyramid Lake. Um, the folks that have been living um, along the Truckee River, it's a very important cultural um, element to, 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 to their daily lives. And along the Truckee River, we've had people living here, well, since forever. A um, few years ago, out on the Pyramid Lake Reservation, there were some there was a study that carbon dated some petroglyphs all, all along the east side of uh, um, what, what's now known as, as Winnemucca Lake Valley. But those, but those petroglyphs were, were carbon dated be, to be between 11,500 and 15,000 years old. Now to kind of put that in, into perspective, later this month, Nevada will be celebrating our 158th birthday as a state, so woohoo, you know. But you go back, you know, we kind of began our, 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 our modern history kind of talking about ancient Egypt. That was, you know, 5,000 years ago. So you go back another 5,000 and potentially another 5,000. That's how long folks have been living in this, in this area and using the Truckee River. Um, the Washoe people, they, 
they have a creation story, Cave Rock up at up at Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe is a very important um, part of, part of their their culture and, and, and remains today today too. Um, and out at Pyramid Lake, that's a very important part for the uh, the Northern Paiute people. And there's there's a creation story around there. You know, besides water, you know, fish were very important along the, the Truckee River for for the Great Basin peoples. Um, the, the Northern Paiute and Washoe, they would often go out to Pyramid Lake out in the spring when there was when the Kuiwi were running, or as they call them, the Kuiwi. Um, it's the only place in the world where, where those fish fish are fish live, but it sustained these folks for thousands and thousands of thousands of years, and, and that tradition still continues on today. During during the spring when they make their migration from Pyramid Lake, traditionally they would go all the way from Pyramid Lake all the all the way up to Lake Tahoe, along with the Lahontan and Cutthroat trout too. You can see from some of these pictures, you know, there's some there's some folks out at, at Pyramid Lake, but but the but the fishing was was very important. You know, another big um, part of the the Northern Nevada experience for for the Native American folks is. Um, around the 1870s, 1880s, we started creating reservations, and so for the Washoe and the Northern Paiute and the and the Southern Paiute and the and the Shoshone folks, they they were put onto reservations, and that had a dramatic effect on, on their way of life. Traditionally, folks in this area would come from Pyramid Lake along the Truckee River all the way up to um, out all the way up to Lake Tahoe, but once reservations were created, um, you know they were they were kind of put. In, into one more area, and there was more of an agri agricultural sort of pers perspective for it too. So folks started moving into the into the city, and and trying to get, trying to you know get get away from the reservations, work here in the, on the railroads or for farms in this area and in the industry in the big cities. And so that's where you started having folks here showing up in, in the east end of in, end of Reno. And in 1917, the federal government, in response to a homeless Indian problem, with the folks kind of living on the outskirts of town. They bought 20 acres uh, for about $6,000, and that, that land is what became the, what we now know as the Reno Sparks Indian Colony um, lands. Um, the federal government came through. They, everybody who was kind of there um, on, on the land, they became, they became a member of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, which consists of the, of the Washoe, the Paiute, and the, and the Shoshone folks today, too. Another important... Um, historical event that happened along the Truckee River is the creation of, of the Derby Dam. About, I don't know, 15 or so miles east of town in 1905, the federal government, as part of a big effort to do water reclamation across the west, built the Derby Dam, diverted the Truckee River out to Fallon for the Newlands Project. It was the nation's first reclamation project. It's what, what we created, um, we now know as Fallon, the agricultural powerhouse of Fallon. But that had a detrimental effect on on the Truckee River. Um, you know, east of the Truckee River is is was uh, was Winnemucca Lake, and in 1936, Winnemucca Lake was declared a uh, national wildlife refuge by by President Roosevelt. By 1939, it was dried up. Um, so between 1905 and 1965, the water level of Pyramid Lake dropped about 65 feet, if you can believe that. Completely destroyed the the fishery. Had a big impact on, 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 on the, uh, the the way of life, but um, as I mentioned before, you know, there's there's still a very big connection with 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 the native folks and non-native folks with with the Truckee River. Um, here on the the bottom left is is a picture of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony Tribal Health Center. Um, the colony specifically bought this land and built their health center next to the river to help with. Um, with some of the, the the traditional medicine programs that that they have, folks use the use the river and the plants for for healing purposes, and and that and that continues um, today. Obviously, you can tell by looking at me, I'm obviously not the best person to be talking about um, the Native American experience here here in Nevada. I've just had the pleasure in my um, career to work for the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe for five years, and for the Reno Sparks Indian Colony for three years. Got to know. Lot and work with a lot of great people and learn learn some really cool stuff. But if you're interested in learning more, I would definitely encourage you to go check out the Pyramid Lake Museum out in Nixon. And then also here in town, you can contact the Reno Sparks Indian Colony um, Cultural Resources Program. Uh, the website is rsic.org, and there's some great information, and you can learn a lot more um, about, about that. So to kind of get into more... Um, you know the river's always played a big a big role in the history and development of of the Reno Sparks area. You know obviously here we're in downtown Reno. We're kind of a a, a, a throw a, a stone's throw away from Lakes Crossing. 
Myron Lake opened up one of the first crossings across the, the, the Truckee River, which now is basically Virginia Street. It's no stranger to Historic Reno Preservation Society, but um, you know, getting across the river was, was, was a big deal, and particularly with the, with the big Comstock mining boom, folks had to get across the river on their way up to, to Virginia City. One of the first um, settlements here in the, in, in the Truckee Meadows was Stone and Gates Crossing, and that was constructed in 1853. Um, it's basically, as you can imagine, where McCarran and Greg Street is today. Um, Charles Gates and, or George Stone and Charles Gates, they were the, they created this uh, Stony Gates, and there was a little uh, agricultural community that, that, that started there. Um, here's a, and that later, uh, that area later grew up to become the town of Glendale. This is a, this is a great photo from my friend. Um, Neil Cobb that I stole from his collection of, of the Glendale Schoolhouse, which was built right next, next to the river. Um, and as you can see, it's very flooding, very prone to, to flooding. Um, this is an earlier flooding, but a uh, flood event. But the Glendale Schoolhouse operated from 1864 all the way up until 1958. It was the first schoolhouse here in the Truckee Meadows. And, um, and it served the town of Glendale and the Truckee Meadows um, in, in general. One of probably its most famous alumni was was a kid that grew up along the banks of the Truckee River. His name was Patrick McCarran. He lived out east east of town and rode his horse in and went to school at the Glendale Schoolhouse. Uh, he later grew up becomes U.S. Senator Patrick McCarran, a very important figure in in Nevada history. The lady um, in the in the picture here, her name is Bertha Refretto, and she was a teacher at the Glendale Schoolhouse, and she's famous for later on. Um, writing Home Means Nevada, our, our state song. And as you can see from this picture, the Truckee River was right in its backyards. We like to think that there was, that there was a connection by, from Bertha's time teaching at the school. You know, there's a line in the state song, out by the Truckee Silvery Rills, out where the sun always shines. That would be in the backyard of, of, of the schoolhouse here. So floods happen. Um, throughout our history, over the last 110 years, we've had 11 significant flood events along the, the Truckee River. As you can see from this photo here, this is an earlier um, flood event from the 20s near the town of Glendale. But just kind of, it's kind of funny showing the you know the new modern Model Ts, but they had to get bailed out of the water by by the by the horses. Um, Here's, a, here's another photo from an earlier flood event. I think this one was in 1950, um, kind of looking out eastward towards, towards Sparks. And um, what, what this photo kind of demonstrates is, is there's, there's a typical recipe for, for a flood event that we have. You know, it's, it's usually heavy snowfall followed, followed by very warm weather and then a bunch of rain. And that rain melts that earlier snowfall and it, and it comes, comes through. What this photo demonstrates here is a phenomenon, geological phenomenon we know as the, as the Vista Narrows. Basically where Vista Boulevard kind of ends that you have the end of the, the Paw mountain range meeting the Virginia um, mountain range and it, it, it narrows right there. And this is really the confluence of where the Truckee River goes through, but it's also where Steamboat Creek comes from um, South Reno and Washoe Valley. It's also where the North Truckee drain comes from, from North Sparks and Spanish Springs. So you have the river, you have steamboat, you have North Truckee drain, all trying to get through this narrow gap. And there's only so much water that can go through there, and it backs up and floods up, floods the entire, the entire valley. Take a step back. We've had a lot of flooding events earlier throughout our history. And this is a, a, an ad from 1938 for the Palace Club, kind of posing fun of that. You know, we had with, when those snowy weather, warm temperatures, followed by rain, backs up the Vista Narrows and it even hits downtown Reno. So the, 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 there was a lot of flooding early on in Reno's history. And I just kind of love the, the rowboat taxi here in this, in this photo, kind of posing fun of, posing fun of that. So the first uh, flood event I wanted to talk about was the flood of 1955. And as the old timers had, had, had called it, it was kind of the mother of all floods. This was the largest flood in our region's history in terms of water. And I'll knock on wood, hopefully that's a record we don't, we don't repeat very, here very often, ever again. But as mentioned before, it was an early December snowstorm 
followed by some unwarm, unseasonably warm temperatures, then there was a big rain event. It was estimated during this flood event, 10 to 13 acre or inches of rain fell in the Sierra mountain ranges during a short amount of time, and that melted about three feet of snowpack. And you can see the result here. By December 21st, um, these wet rainstorms kept rolling in, but the Weather Service wasn't very concerned. They thought it was going to be colder than it, than, it was, than it turned out to be. Business owners, on the other hand, were, had been through this a bunch of times, and they started to do sandbagging and had kind of were not listening to the Weather Service. The next day, on December 22nd, um, the Weather Service changed their tune, and then official um, flood preparations be began. On December 24th, over two inches of rain fell here in Reno. Up in, this, up in the upper Truckee watershed, over five inches of rain fell in a 24-hour period. And up by Blue Canyon, which is just near uh, Immigrant, Grap, Immigrant Gap on the California side, um, 9.31 inches of rain fell in a 24-hour in a, in a period. So just a ton of rain, a ton of water melting snow, snowpack. Here's a photo, I think, of the Arlington Bridge um, of, of the original crane guys. And what they would do is they would, you know, to take take heavy equipment to pick up branches and other debris to prevent other flooding from from, from happening and damage to the to the bridge structure. At the what was then called the Reno Municipal Airport, it received over four feet of flood 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 waters, and it covered the runways and did a lot of damages to the facilities. This uh, hangar is roughly the location of where the Nevada Air National Guard um, hangar is, is today. So you can see just how much water came, came through uh, and, and hit, the, hit the airport. You know, one thing to consider in 1955, you know, the, the population of Washoe County was only 90,000 people. Um, City of Reno was only about 40,000 and Sparks was, was just a small company town, railroad town at that point. It was only about 12,000 people. Today in the Truckee Meadows in Washoe County, the, the overall population is about 477,000. Reno is up over 255,000. Sparks is over 102,000. So between 1955 and, and today, a lot more people, but it was, but it was a lot more um, agricultural and, and less developed than, than it is today. Here's another photo, um, and I'm not really sure where this bridge is. I thought it might be you know, an earlier Kits Kitsky Lane or Glendale Bridge. If anyone knows, let me know after, after the program here. But, just, but this shows just how much water was coming through, through the Truckee River. And really the whole valley was described in a lot of the literature as a giant bathtub, just with the amount of water that, that came through in 55. This is a photo of, of Lockwood, just, just east of Sparks. And at that time, it was, you know, just, just all farmland. Today, it's, 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 it's a neighborhood with, with a lot of houses and stuff. But you can see it was heavily, heavily uh, flooded. Um, fortunately, in Nevada, there was only one death during this, during this flood event. On the California side, there was, there was 48 um, fatalities. Um, the flood in 1955 caused an estimated 515 uh, million dollars in damages and was declared a federal disaster by President Eisenhower. Here's just kind of some more um, some more damage photos. But one thing that, that happened during the flood of 1955, it knocked out the roads north, south, east, and west out of town. There was no way, no way to get out of there. It also knocked out telephone service and electricity for, for a very long time. Just a, you know, a, a, a terrible event. The next uh, flood event I wanted to talk about was the New Year's flood of, of 1997. Um, in terms of water, this was only number four in terms of water that, that came down, down the Truckee River. But however, in terms of damage, this was by far number one. And hopefully that's the record that, that doesn't ever get, get repeated. Um, this was classified as a 100-year storm event, or 100-year flood event. and. It always kind of confuses me. Maybe this is just my, my planner brain, and this is an engineering term, and I can't ever wrap my head around it. But the term 100-year flood event, it's not, you know, we have the flood, and this is going to be the only flood we're going to have in 100 years. It's more of a statistical kind of way of describing it. And during a 100-year flood event, there's a 1% and there's a one percent chance over 100 years that there would be a flood. So basically, you kind of look at it as a 1 in 100 chance 
that kind of describes the magnitude of, of the flood. We, have, we sometimes have 50-year flood events, and that means one out of every 50 years, one, one out of 50 times there would, so that's a much smaller flood event. Sometimes you hear a 500-year flood event, that means there'd be only one in 500% chance. So this was a 100-year flood event, a very significant event um, I- indeed, but, and you can kind of see the extent of the, the flood waters. This is Interstate 80. This is 395. The Reno Hilton, as it was known then, was right here. This is downtown Sparks, and this is the the Vista Narrows, um, Hidden Valley. So all of the yellow area here is kind of the extent of this of this flood of the flooding area. Um, one of the things about the flood of 1997, I think, from a historical perspective, it really marked the literally and figuratively the high water mark of gaming in downtown Reno. You know, for roughly 70 years, gaming in downtown Reno had been growing, and and during the flood of 1997, it really was kind of the final nail in the coffin for some of these smaller smaller clubs. You can see the uh, the old river river or the you know the, the flamingo, the Kings Inn, the Bonanza, um, you know the uh, the Virginian. All of these after the flood event after the floodwaters came in, a lot of those those casinos didn't open up. The other half of it was, was in the late 90s, you had the rise of um, tribal gaming in California, and that offered a lot more competition to, to, to the Reno gaming market. And really between 2000 and 2010, the gaming market here in, in northern Nevada shrunk by one third. So that's kind of how, it, so, this is, so this had a big, big event on kind of the history of, of gaming in downtown Reno as well too. So here we are on Virginia Street during the, the flood of uh, 97. Um, you know, more, con- more crane guys pulling out debris and other stuff from, from, from the river. Um, here's here's a photo uh, that I that I that I stole from some of the the, the, the TV coverage. But this is the Reno Hilton um, here. This is the, where the driving range is. That that, that lake behind the uh, the Reno Hilton. What had happened was is the the the, the, the banks of the Truckee River had 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 gone past the banks of the Truckee River and started flooding the east side of, of, of the Hilton. Here's another shot kind of um, towards East McCarran looking towards downtown Reno. And uh, at first, you know, the weather, the weather service wasn't anticipating a flood. The, uh, the temp- they had a big storm. We had a big winter storm earlier in December. By the middle of the month, there was, there, it, 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 was, it was supposed to be colder weather. It started warming up, and then towards around th- um, Christmas and end of the New Year's holiday, it started raining um, quite a bit. And just to kind of show how fast that the that the weather conditions had changed from what the weather service was was predicting, here's a, here's a plane that got stranded at at the Reno airport. By the time this plane had landed and got to its gate, the runway was closed. The runway was flooded, and the gate was was closed as well too. And the next photo will kind of show from the from the airport. A lot of these planes were were, were stranded with with the runways being 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 closed. It was uh, yeah. I think the, the 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 airport was closed for several for several days during this during this flood event. Here's just a wild picture of um, Washoe Valley, which really during the flood of '97 became Washoe Lake. As you can see from the from the flood event, this is um, Interstate 580 US 395 as it was there. Um, this would be, you know, New Washoe City, but you can just see all of the, all of the water from Washoe Lake and this, and this flooding was, was right there. And, 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 remind, and re, as you might recall from earlier, all of this water drains through the Steamboat Creek and into the Vista Narrows and into the Truckee River. So all of this water was, was coming through. So that added significantly to the damage that, that we had here in, in the Truckee Meadows. Um, one of the, one of the, just to kind of go back to where how fast the water was rising, the Alamo truck stop and, and Sparks that flooded and left a lot of the trucks flooded over there. There's kind of some funny stories of, you know, uh, with the pass being closed, Donner Pass being closed because there was a big, um, there was a big mudslide. It forced all of the the trucks that were you know normally go east and west, they were parking all around Reno. There was nowhere for them to park, um, so a couple. A few truckers actually ended up taking refuge out at the Mustang Ranch brothel over in, in, in Story County. 
And when the flood waters went up and over the, the, Truckee, the Truckee River, I'd imagine there was probably some interesting discussions with their boss and probably some even harder discussions with, with their spouses about you know, when, why, the, why they were there during the flood event. But the, you know, the, the, the biggest damage that happened from the flood in 1997 was in the Sparks in, industrial area. Um, in the 19, in the flood, during the flood in 1955, these were all farmlands. Um, and during the 60s and 70s, the city of Sparks was becoming more developed and, and this became a, a, an important industrial area. Um, here's, here's some more kind of showing the, the, overall, the overall damage. Um, one of the things, this is an industrial area, so you can imagine there's a lot of chemicals, there's a lot of fuel, there's a lot of bad stuff. And so when the, when the floods hit the, uh, the industrial area, that stuff is all in, in, in this water. Additionally, too, you know, the, the storm drains backed up and the sewers backed up. That really hit these, hit these businesses hard. And this is kind of a very blurry photo, but it's looking, this is downtown Reno. This is the, the railroad track. This would be the nugget, that, that blurry thing. But you can kind of just see the devastation of, of, the, of the, the industrial area. Here's, a, here's another shot. This is from Channel 4's coverage, and um, it just kind of shows the phenomenon of only so much water can go through the Vista Narrows here. This is roughly McCarran Boulevard. This would be Pembroke and Rock Boulevard today, too. So this is uh, you know, University Farms and um, Hidden Valley, as it was, too. During the flood of 97, um, the during a typical flood or during a typical um during a typical time over 6,000 cubic feet of water goes through the the vista narrows from uh during a during a flood event it reaches between 17 17,000 and 18,000 that's when it hits a flood event during the flood of 97 it was estimated that there was 24,000 cubic feet of water per second coming through through the area um the, the the thing is with uh, the Vista Narrows is there was the the flood gauge only goes up to twenty four thousand so there's projections that it might even hit twenty twenty eight thousand or or thirty thousand in uh, uh, that much water going through and you can see how how it just kind of backs up into the whole into the whole area there you know one of the one of the big legacies I don't know what was going on with his phone but um, one of the one of the big legacies of the the flood of '97 is I think is is the Sparks Marina. This is a photo of kind of the the development plan from the 1960s of 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 what we now know as the Sparks Marina area. This is Interstate area. This ring future ring road is became uh, McCarran Avenue or McCarran Boulevard. Here's where Sierra Sid's truck stop and Western Village um, Casino is, and uh, this is roughly where the the Sparks Marina. Um, had come so there were there were plans to do that during the 1970s the Helms construction company purchased um, the land and they started mining for um, aggregate and other materials and that was used for building roads and building buildings so any any building or expansion of, of a building that was built between the 70s and the 80s the materials came from the, the Helms pit and um, this mining activity created a lake and so during the flood of, of, of 1997, um, water from the, the Truckee River ended up going into, into what was then called the, the, the Helms Lake. Um, and this is a, a photo of, of, of the water going into the, into the lake there. But the decision was made by, by, the, by the city when the, when the flood waters kept backing up at the Vista Narrows and starting to hit more of the industrial area, um, there was a real fear that that the water would go up and over Interstate 80 and start hitting some of uh, some of the neighborhoods. So the city made the decision to build a little diversion channel and divert some of that water into the Helms Pit. Um, you know, as as we discussed before, it was the Helms Pit was just an aggregate pit. So they would just they were just grabbing you know dirt and rock and other materials out of there. So when you dropped all of this water water into the pit it would start churning at the bottom and it created a lot of erosion. And, um, and what that erosion ended up doing, because it was about a hundred foot drop 
um, at, at the time. It ended up churning and churning, and it ended up um, actually eroding a part of Interstate 80 here in, in, into that. And I have a little video from, from Channel 2's coverage of the flood that kind of shows um, what was going on there. Uh, here, this water here is coming out of a culvert on the uh, So that's the diversion channel that, that the city had built. The, uh, side towards Reno that's roughly the, the parking lot there um, it's coming in front of Shields in the, the movie theaters. Culvert under the freeway and running down there. They dug a trench earlier today so the water will go into the pit way, way down there. Yeah, I see that. So that once they get the big drop that water and that churning, there, they see how Interstate uh, 80 dammed up right here, collapsed, then they'll right, be able collapsed to right better there. assess what it is they need to do to fill this great big huge hole that has been created. You don't realize it at first. You're so busy worried about composition and how you're going to make the shot look. I mean, that as a photographer, that's what you are trained to think about. So you don't think Wonder about what that until I got up to the edge and I held the shot and I looked around and then I opened up my left eye. Usually you keep it shut when you're doing shooting so you can kind of see what's going on. As I opened it up, then I could see everything beneath me and, and the road dropped off 200 feet down to the bottom of Helm's Pit. The water running down there is, is a sight. There's a little prick on, the, on your, me on your left now. I was watching it. The road as I was watching it. Sharks, go north left on the water. So after the Interstate 80 collapsed into the Helm's Pit, um, NDOT and the city worked together. And, uh, you know, they, they, it was a big engineering effort to fill that back in and stabilize, stabilize the roadway so it wouldn't continue to, to fall in. Got some in engineers and some other guys just standing around with their hands in their pockets here. <laughs> but I think this, you know, here's, here's some more uh, work on the, on the stabilization. But I think this whole event could really be summarized well with the, with the a, tr a cartoon that appeared in the Sparks Tribune right after the flood of 1997, um, where uh, you have uh, the Helms Pit here, Interstate 80 collapsing, and then you have the news camera asking this guy with the hard hat, you know, any comments, and and dang, and uh, that Mr. Carey, that was my, that was my dad. He was the public works director at, at the time. So we have it, it's just kind of a funny little little cartoon with this summarizing that whole episode. But really, you know, with, with, the, with the floodwaters coming in, affecting the neighborhoods, they were really concerned about the, the Park Vista apartments there on, on Sparks Boulevard and even the neighborhood to, to the north. And so it was a lot of the efforts to um, divert that water into the, in the Helms Pit cr created a lot less damage for, for the area, which, which, which was a really good thing. And it ended up creating the Sparks Marina, as, as we know today. And this is kind of an older photo. Um, the uh, Northern Nevada Veterans Memorial is, is being constructed right now. It's going to be opening up in, in a couple weeks here. But what the city was able to do with the water that came in from the, from the flood and with the FEMA disaster emergency money and some settlement money from the tank farm, because that was leaking into the Helms Pit and carousing some environmental issues, the city was able to kind of package all of that money and develop the Sparks Marina Park. And the Sparks Marina Park, it's the most popular and most visited city park that we have, but it's also attracted a lot of investment. You have the legends at the Sparks Marina. This is the, uh, this is the Shields shot, uh, sporting goods store. Have some lakefront development. And you know, we have lakeside homes. You know, we never had waterfront homes in Sparks until you know, the, the, the Sparks Marina. So it's, it's kind of really redefined the, the, the city. So one of the one of the other things with the with the flood in '97, it really um, led folks to really get more serious about emergency management in this in this region and and working more collaboratively together. And uh, as a result of that, in 2001, after the experience of the flood in '97, the voters here in Washoe County approved um, a, a sales tax increase, and that helped funded the regional um, emergency management center up on up on Par Boulevard. And so from that event, you know, Reno and the city and the state and Sparks and the county, they decided to work together um, more, more closely to, to, to work on all emergency management, just not flooding, but overall. It also kick-started the, uh, the Truckee Meadows flood, flood project, and that's an effort that continues with, with the cities and the county today. And um, there's still a lot of work to do. There's, there's been a lot of good improvements, but there's still a lot of work to do. With, with, with that, that, that project. 
So really, that's the end of uh, my, 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 my presentation. I hope you've gained a more appreciation for the history of the Truckee River and how it's important to the people that live here today and have lived here since, well, forever. And um, I hope you also learned some, some fun stuff about the flood of 1955 and the flood of 97 and how, this re how, how, the, how, the, how the river is really going to do what, it, what it's going to do. As much as we want to you know, engineer and try to build facilities, when there's a huge snowstorm, followed by warm weather, and then a bunch of rain, it's going to flood. And so we need to be prepared, and we need to, you know, protect the river um, m moving forward. So appreciate you all um, listening to, to my spiel. If there's any questions, be happy to take them. Thank you. As I take a walk along the Truckee River around the Idlewild Park area, I've always seen big slabs of concrete or little chunks of concrete. Where did all that come from? Yeah, great question about um, the flood improvements here in downtown Reno. Um, let me even go back. Yeah, I think it was in the in the 1950s. You know, after a bunch of these earlier flood events, um, the the Corps of Engineers um, built a lot of these flood improvements um, here in here in the in the downtown Reno area. I think this is Virginia Street. This would be Center Street or Sierra. I forget I'm in Reno. And um, so what they what they had done, you know, after there was that earlier photo of the Palace Club and you know, hitting, hitting the, the businesses really hard. So the Corps of Engineers, when they came through in the 50s, they decided to channel the Truckee River, put in concrete to make it kind of move as fast as possible and move and move through through the area. Um, and more recent, and obviously, you can see in the flood of 97, didn't really work. But in, in more recent times, I know particularly around um, uh, Wingfield Park, the, uh, the 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 county with the with the Truckee River flood control project they had put in the uh, the white water rafting park and some other improvements to kind of help the river be more natural and and respond better during during a during a flooding event. Any other questions? In the time span that I've lived here, 15 years, I can remember one year where fish were dying in the Sparks Marina. Is that not fed? just naturally from water from the Truckee River? Yeah, great question about um, about the, the, the fishery at the, at the Sparks Marina and, and, with, and with fish dying off, you know. Um, and and I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a biologist, but I know, you know, one, one thing that, that, that's important to consider, it was, it was an aggregate pit. It was a mine, active mining operation, and you fill it with water, and woohoo, it's a lake. And um, you know, so I, I think in terms of the biology and the, and the water levels and and those sorts of things, it it's it, it, it's not a natural lake. It takes some time. One of the things that happened after the construction of the Sparks Marina Park is the city actually installed a uh, a water pump that pumps water from the from the Truckee River into the Sparks Marina and back out so there is there is some water that gets pumped in regularly through there one of the things i know and it's happened a couple times just walking around the the marina myself particularly in the winter when when it gets really cold that that, that, that really hurts the oxygen levels for the fish and that's where you start seeing a big a big die off and i know every year in dow the nevada department of, of wildlife they do uh, they do stock that 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 fishery with I think rainbow trout and the hot and cutthroat trout, but there's also carp, and um, that, that that are in there as well as well too. So it's kind of a continual sort of a thing, but it is a very active and very popular ur urban fishery. How long did it take them to repair eighty? Yeah, I think it was it was a couple weeks. It, it, it took them. Yeah, it was you know it was a it was a round the clock operation here. You know, they, they brought in just a ton of material, you know, with, with the big rocks and other things to kind of stabilize it. But it was, you know, I think Interstate 80 was down to one lane, you know, for, for several weeks. And um, thankfully, it, it's, it, 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 keeps, it keeps flowing. Because you, you think it's, it's Interstate 80, that's a, it's a very important roadway for not only our, our region, but the entire nation. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of freight and people going, going through that area. So they had to, to keep it open. 
reveals us in Derby Dam in La Houghton. What happened there further down? We, we had a flood here. It's going through the Narrows. Did, they didn't help at all then. Oh, sure. You know, what What did, what did traditionally happen with, um, you know, the, the Carson River, you know, that would that would go from from Carson City through Dayton, and then and then with the construction of the the the, rec, the Newlands project, that's what created Lake Lahontan, and um, and then but naturally all that water would go out to the Stillwater um, Wildlife Refuge, very important or um, flyway for the Pacific fly for birding um, birding folks. But with the uh, during the flood of '97 with the diversion dam built there and at the derby dam you know, that water still flows through through the canal and it would, it would actually end up out out there as well too they say during the flood of 97 the water level of pyramid lake went up 12 feet in, in one year and um so just just a lot of water but a, but the water that didn't go through went out to the still water area and you know just went out there not naturally as, as as well too so just you know a ton of water going out there um i think it was 2007 there was a big flood event out in fernley when when the canal breached and started flooding a bunch of those neighborhoods so there's that's kind of like a, a man-made sort of um flooding event because the river didn't go through through fernley 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 naturally and they're still trying to work on maintaining that that canal but you know it, it's but one of the one I think another big legacy of of the flood in '97 is the the Truckee River Operating Agreement. Um, in 1990, there was a big um, settlement uh, between the state of California, state of Nevada, the counties, the cities, the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, the Fallon Paiute Shoshone Tribe, um, and basically that was a groundbreaking water agreement that went through Congress. That, does, that basically divvied up how the water is going to be used, how the folks out of the Newlands Project are going to get their water to, to grow agriculture, how we in the, in the Truckee Meadows are going to get our water to have a city, um, how the tribe is going to get its water to, to maintain its fishery and keep, keep Pyramid Lake going. And, and that, that, that is a groundbreaking um, settlement that's, that's been in place for about 30 years now. And and it's it's it it has at least on paper it's supposed to you know maintain the the, the balance and it's it's very you know they say the Truckee River is one of the most litigated water waterways in 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 the world and that that's probably true and there's there's still some more more fighting to do. Any other questions? All right, this is getting off easy. Thank you very much, folks.